There was a period of time when, because we were really poor, there were times when rent can be paid and things were really difficult. But I didn't want to be an artist. I saw my parents often questioning everything about their lives. Is this good? Is this bad? This is crap now. I'm going to throw this away. Uh, we can't afford this. I saw them struggle through a lot of things, but then there were moments of absolute divinity. But then all of my pieces often are to do with female power, the fear of it. Through centuries, women have been burned, told they're witches. The hatred and hurt of women, that for me, these pieces were about transformation. I'm really interested in this idea of metamorphosis. Also the need for art in times of absolute horror and how art can be healing and the process of art can be healing as well. It's good to make time. And thank you for coming and joining. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And first question that I ask, that I ask everybody, mm -hmm. what is art? Right. So... <laughs> <laughs> that's, always a, that's always huge. a good... Uh, that's a good starting point, isn't it? It's a good starting point. Uh, um, right. I would see it as something that's being created uh, intentionally at, from born of concept, sometimes from experimentation as well. And whether that takes a physical um, form in a material uh, or whether that uh, can be ethereal as well, also like a performance um, that exists in a time or a moment. And sometimes it's witnessed by one person, sometimes it's witnessed by many. So I would say... Yeah, that is art in Japan. They don't have a de um, two separate words for art and craft. It's one and the same thing because that's a discussion I think that happens a lot in the UK about um, still, which is kind of boring for me, but uh, that there's a division between what is craft and what is art. I wonder what is lacking in, in craftsmanship that is present in artistry. Isn't it like the 15th century where that changes? So there's a point where if you were painting, say, um, a painting for religious purpose in mm. the 1500s medieval England, right? Or Italy, let's say. Uh, and you're painting, uh, you would be paid by the hour for your time as a... Uh, how other craftspeople would be as well, or other people making, let's say creators rather than craftspeople, makers yeah. being, um, and you'd be paid for your materials, time, whatever. Then there was a change that became where it was about the concept or some were defined as better painters than others. And you think of, of master painters like... Um, Giotto and I think actually I can't remember and my mum has told me this before so I should know but there was a point where um, that started to change and I, I think it might have been Giotto when he painted the blue sky in Padova which was all made from crushed lapis lazuli that he it was paid differently or the moment in which it changed about how it was considered you know like master painters so then you think of uh, Michelangelo or Da Vinci and 1600s moving forward how artists were paid in a different way because it was masterpieces, right? But even that in painting is interesting how different it is to if you look at Egypt uh, under Hellenistic rule in Alexandria, there's one of the biggest cameos in the world which is called La Tazza Farnese which is a massive piece of sardonyx that was carved out of uh, sardonyx, which is a hard type of agate, and that was made. The the technical ability to do this with the tools that they we don't have today to carve a material like this in the the way it's carved is sensational, ridiculous, yeah. right? And it's all done by hand. It would have taken ages, and it was commissioned by um, Cleopatra. And it, there's a whole massive political thing within it entrenched. So it's super conceptual and political and I mean, social. If, political if, kind if of Cleopatra thing. is commissioning yeah. your art, you have to do exactly. something pretty impressive, phenomenal, right? <laughs> and it would have probably been one person who did this um, and that when it came up for auction years later because the history of this piece has gone through so many different hands and collections when it came up for auction against uh, I think it was loads of Raffaello Michelangelo um oh, who's the one Botticelli it was loads of paintings this one 
cameo sold more than all those pieces together, oh, right? Wow. And so it was because it was valued that cameos and that artistry and that stone carving was so, was just like that at the time was what was considered the highest um, art form or piece of artwork. He's so paved the way for all of those ones that came after in the auction, well, essentially. Yeah, but then that, but, but that whole thing of like then that changes and now paintings, a painting will go for way more than a cameo. Um, and I just that perception, material perceptions, perceptions of art, of craft, of how something's made, of, you know, a big pieces of artworks often now take large groups of people and the name that's put to it isn't necessarily the person who physically makes that piece. Mm. I'm not going to say any names, but we know lots of um, you... artists who employ and they have to sign contracts which are about this thick saying they will not say who actually made the piece, mm. who carved it, set the dimes in it, did whatever it is. And I think that's really interesting of this kind of shame of the craft. Or well, there's this... a, it's a, I think it's a little known secret that a lot of of major artists have workshops and and yeah. a, and ateliers that are full of younger artists who carry out the labor yeah. essentially yeah. which is someone I, I used to live in Antwerp and one of the biggest artists there has the exact same situation and uh, the girl I was with at the time was like, it's disgusting, blah, 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 blah. How can you call yourself an artist when you have a, a, a shop of laborers? I was like, mm. For me, it's like there's actually something quite beautiful about it. Not about the ownership or the way that it's, uh, or, or the hierarchy of it, I said, mm. but I guess. But then it kind of plays into my idea of that that someone, that the major artist is at the top of the hierarchy because at the tip of the pyramid mm -hmm. is closest to the sky, closest to the gods or whatever, closest to that point of inspiration. So it's only right that in this world that we have now that the artist who sits on the top of that can then delegate the ideas to, to people below, essentially, who can carry out the labor so that that person is free to stay in touch with inspiration and just essentially While bridge and bridge over messages, which I think is, you know, it, it's better that than working in a call center or something like, like that because you're still in touch with the craft and all of those younger artists hopefully we'll get to a point like the artist well, you like mentioned. It's like the apprenticeship, isn't it? Exactly. You have to, to be able to be a true master, you have to have an apprenticeship. You have to have a period of time where you are present in the making, but mm. not, there's something else that isn't quite aligned with it but yet, then there's spiritually. some people who've made that complete jump, haven't they? Where it's actually about how you are as a salesperson or a spoke person. Not that that's a negative, but just like, it's quite like a magician aspect to it. Look at like um, Duchamp, right? Mm. Okay, so he, I was having a conversation with one of my friends who's Japanese once, who was saying to me, why is conceptual art more important here in London, in the UK, than craft. And I said, well, I don't think it is, but uh, I suppose because, and then my, someone I know came in and said, well, because the West invented conceptual art with Duchamp. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't know. And we got into this really big conversation. And when I went then to Japan, they had, um, there was an exhibition which <laughs> was, there was this beautiful bamboo there was a poster right and it said Duchamp and something in Japanese so I was like what's this I don't understand they'd put two objects one was of the signed toilet and one was of a uh, bamboo uh, ikebana holder which looks like a piece of bamboo that had a signature on it that had been cut and uh, Zen my friend explained to me that he was saying oh actually Senor Raikyu was a um, artist uh, who existed I can't remember it was several hundred years before Duchamp who had taken a already existing ready-made signed it and then it attained to him and so, and I was like so basically the Japanese invented it before yeah, Duchamp yeah. and then he was like yeah but someone else could have done that it's of course like, it, 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 it happened over and over and yes. over again for time immemorial like yeah. it's the most tr primal thing to wake up in the world grab something and claim it as your own it's your own 
And that's, I think, that how you imbue an object or imbue something with a presence of yourself or an idea is where it's interesting, right? And for me, I find through actual making or the thing that I am focusing on, it's a, that state which I think musicians, artists, painters, uh, wh- however you define it, people who are in touch with the material that they're making of whatever social hierarchical aspect that they're in, there's a moment when you lose sense of everything else around you and you're so focused in on what you're doing I think there can be a transcendence of what that is that you're trying to convey in the piece yeah though I find looking at a Caravaggio incredibly moving and because he worked with real people he was conveying the stories and narratives from the world around him for me he's like one of the ultimates because uh, and he painted his own pieces you know for me it's actually the act of doing that that you put, but then you look at Louise Bourgeois who when she was younger she did a, a, made a lot of her work and then as she got older she had people working with her she was very transparent about that as well and she didn't do all the carving the big marble pieces or all the metal work of her huge spiders physically for someone of her age that was difficult um, but I think they still create a sense of awe or, or and I wonder how Perhaps the way you inspire the people who you're hiring or talk to them, it's like teamwork. Of course it Mm. is. It's like how, if you want to convey or make something, is everyone on board with that? It's a a similar way of looking at it with a film director or with an orchestra conductor or whoever wrote uh, a symphony. You know, it's like they don't necessarily... Their idea is the sum of a lot of parts. So it's, it is beautiful when it comes from the source and it's streaming straight from the person into the tool and out into the world. But then also there's something, there's an added element of harmony when you have to communicate this ideal to a bunch of people from a wide range of experiences and have them all buy into the same idea. Yeah. So it's like you, you can almost understand how you could make a religion out of art. Yes. Because there is oh, a... Ve- art is religion, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. It's, we'll get, <laughs> we'll get on to that. But in, in a sense of like, you have your person who's ordained and then you have your people who buy into the idea and give themselves over to the making of that idea a reality. Yeah. Which is... is and maybe that's why religion... I mean... It, We'll get onto the art, or maybe we should just go straight into the art I mean, of religion. It's massive, <laughs> but there's a there's a reason why religion lent so heavily on art. Oh yeah, I and it's mean, because they're one color. in the, they're one in the color even in painting, right? Yeah. So I'm love. I'm kind of obsessed with blue and lapis lazuli blue, which travelled from Af- one mine in Afghanistan to with a group of tradesmen from Afghanistan who'd come to uh, Venice, and it was traded there for more than the price of gold to be ground up and used in religious painting. And it was by law that it was only Mary who could have the blue in her mm. in her, her gown. And when you look at what we were saying before, Giotto's sky, which is done with lapis lazuli, it just exudes this amazing like vibrancy, like a frequency almost. And actually, there's, a, I think it is ultramarine, the way that it's something to do with the way we receive the colour as well, um, to do with the cones in your eyes or whatever. It has a different frequency or way that we receive it than other colour. And there's something like, obviously, like the sky, the sea, uh, the mystical is blue as well. Um, but I find the whole like that aspect of religion and colour so powerful and Titian used it as well in famous painting that's at the National, like how blue conveyed so much um, power in a way. But well, How do you feel about an artist like Eve Klein? I love Eve Klein, that's exactly who I was going to say as well. Who, who all they do the with the colour yeah. is present it. They don't necessarily use it to communicate other anything other than the colours existence. That's similar to Rothko though and the emotion that a, a colour envelopes you and you're just presenting the colour which a lot of my friends when I was doing my art A level were like I don't get the whole thing of Rothko or like colour and I would try and explain it and they were, you know those discussions were great on the bus mm. on the way back from our art class in Croydon like it was kind of like okay cool like you know we used to get into massive rows about it it was really interesting um, because it's not just like the imitation of nature it's about emotion or a different way of receiving and also 
I always so think like we always reference like visual art, but what if you're blind or if you're partially sighted or colorblind? Same with death and touch and all these things. We put huge precedent on the visual aspect. But going back to Yves Klein, um, he was one of the first artists I got quite obsessive about. And he, I remember seeing his work, I think he was at the Louvre when I was 13. Me and my mum went to Paris. We won a holiday on a scratch card. <laughs> nice. And we went and we were, we stayed in like, I don't know if, know if you've ever seen Belleville Rendezvous, which is a beautiful little animation. And um, it's uh, it's really funny. But anyway, there's a bit where they talk about like staying in an area which was right by um, a train track and the whole house shook. We were staying in like a motorway on the periphery of Paris. And part of the holiday was to go to uh, Disneyland. My mum was like, no, we're not going to Disneyland. We're going to the Louvre. And I was like, inside, kind of like, oh, what? <laughs> you would have liked to go. And we went and I saw the Vitria Samothrace, which is probably my favourite sculpture of all time, a uh, Hellenistic Greek piece, um, and Yves Klein. And I saw the paintings, I think it was with the moving body where he dragged yeah, yeah, the body yeah. in blue, which immediately is movement and the panels of just pure pigment. And yeah. I think some of them had the sponges as well. And then I started to look at... Um, the photograph where it's a photo montage where he, it's called Leaping Into the Void. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that thing of like belief and plunging yourself into something. And yeah, I I really, I don't have a problem with that at all. Like, when I, I walked love it. around, a, I went to Eve Klein exhibition, at, I can't remember the place's name, but it was in Brussels. And I was in there and I was like, his conceptual work up until the point of the colours of the pigment I was like, this is all incredible. And then we, we got to the colour and I kind of felt a bit short-changed. Oh, really? Well, I feel similar with Rothko and, 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 and with most post-modern stuff. I get to a point of where I'm like, yeah, I hear you. The colour is fantastic and the mm -hmm. colour itself is a mm -hmm. miracle. Mm -hmm. But what, for me, the miracle of art is being able to seize that colour and take it to a, a higher level and imbue it with meaning, not just wonder. So you add the meaning element in and then suddenly you start a dialogue, you start a conversation, you but start then, to redefine reality. But then I think that's, I think that's similar to just like, well, for me, and I don't know if this is perhaps how other people, some people feel about it as well, it's like by just giving it in its pure form like that and putting it in a space, because you're already redefining the definition of how you're receiving that by putting it in a, a gallery space or on a canvas or through an object, even the Venus de Milo in blue, right? That's not his... He didn't carve the Venus. He already took a form and then made it blue. Um, I just think presenting it in that way and also when we think of what came before that how presenting something like that same with Fontana with the slit uh, canvases which, lot is, of people. which is my the, the, the saving grace of postmodernism it's, and it's also probably the greatest art piece <laughs> uh, apart from life it, <laughs> itself see I thought you might not like that no that's the greatest work okay. of art you don't need to make anything else after that it's like if I'm going to look at postmodern art I'll look at that that's it. Because that will tell you everything you need to know about everything. Sweet, let's move on now. <laughs> that's Because that's the, the perfect um, intersection of presenting something in its form, in its purity, but also it being imbued with the highest order of meaning. Like, that's the best work of art for me, it, uh, objectively. That is the purpose of art, is that, is that piece of work. Then after that, I'm like, all right, sweet. Let's now let's move on and and change direction because it's been done. Yeah. <laughs> it's finished. But that's now. the thing, isn't it? It's like the continuous reinvention or mediums and what is uh, important for a time. Uh, what's eternal? What is needed right now? I feel like art should always be a reaction to when it's being made and why it's being made for what purpose. Um, so if we look at the social political aspect of things or the emotional narratives of individuals, if they're commissioned pieces for you know whether that's a portrait of a child that passed away or whether that's um, a piece of jewellery that's to celebrate the love of two people or whether that's um, a t-shirt that had printed your dad's picture uh, from a marathon he'd done. I don't know. There's so many different like ways of how um, like we put meaning into things and at 
certain times why certain pieces are made and how they're presented and in the personal sphere and the public sphere. So, that, and what survives as well and who chooses. I find that really interesting about who who is the definition or what, what kind of... Um, What's high art, low art? Um, why is one person's opinion more important than another's? Um, that's always an ongoing conversation, right? Mm. Well, yeah. Why did why did the craftsman paint a sky, and then suddenly the idea of craftsmanship <laughs> and artistry was fractured, and a line was drawn, and then everybody said, "This is now art after this line." That's is the most fascinating thing. Was what are these people seeing mm. in it? Are they just seeing? Uh, a recreation of reality or are they seeing it with something added that they were never aware of before so p postmodernism happens as a reaction to the war art has no meaning anymore because life has no meaning because evil exists and we could all just be destroyed in at any at any moment and actually a lot of post-war work is phenomenally amazing like the dada surrealism mm. like a lot of the work that came out from that was such a shift wasn't it yeah it was and a seismic shift yeah. and it reflects the time like i couldn't imagine what it would be like to to live along and create alongside yeah. a war when everything you're fighting for pre that time which i'm at, at coming out of like romanticism or whatever is is spirit and love and and joy and nature and all of that stuff and to see it be destroyed. Uh, there was a book called The Hair with the Amber Eyes. I've not actually read it by Edmund Dewell, who's a ceramicist, which is about a collection of Netsuke. I know what it's about, um, which is a collection of Netsuke, which are small Japanese objects which were used in traditional menswear um, as a sash toggle. And they were small... Uh, sculptures, artworks that could have been carved from bone, wood, um, inlaid with um, shell, used with lacquer. And he, they had a collection of them and they survived because they were small and they could be swallowed or tucked away. And they went through, uh, they were a Jewish family and obviously uh, like it's their story of how they survived through that time. Um, same with like destruction of things in Petra, like how things have been um, demolished or um, because of religion and war and all these things. I think that's, um, it's kind of interesting how things survive and also the need for art in times of absolute horror um, and how art can be healing and the process of art can be healing as well. And um, if you, you know, I find when I've had really uh, traumatic times in my life, or needed time of contemplation, I would sometimes, I either go to the sea um, or I go sometimes to an art museum on my own and sit in front of a piece of work. Um, and I think that also, I know at least in the UK, having free spaces, which you have these P amazing pieces which you it's not like a shopping mall that you'd hang out like at Lucian where we'd sit and like prop with Primark or whatever it was like you'd go into a space you're not there to buy anything or like to get necessarily engage with uh, capitalist systems sort or of things you're sitting in there and it becomes like a church you're looking at these altar pieces and these um, things that may have taken you know, I mean, actually, let's even if you look at the church like the Duomo in Milan, that took 500 years to build. Yeah. And the top of it as is as intricate as the inside, if not more, because God is looking down upon it. So just to talk about extraness of making, but it's the same way when you go to somewhere like, um, I don't know, the V&A or the Tate or um, a lot of these spaces that are free for people that you can sit and spend time to contemplate. And it's taking also the time to do that and give yourself space. So I My mum was brought up by nuns in Italy where she went to a school where she... and. Um, had a quite like Catholic upbringing though now she doesn't call herself Christian she still goes to pray and I had when I have had people who have passed away in my life I don't go to church but I have gone and prayed or I pray this morning I made a prayer while I was having a shower about something that I really really hope for someone will happen and it was a moment of focused thought of putting that out and whether that focuses your mind whether something in the molecular structure of how everything is connected hears that um I don't know but yeah for me that kind of 
I can't remember where we started on that tangent, but about... Living through atrocities. Yes, there you go. And so, salvaging the art. Yeah, and how artworks can be... Also, the actual creation or making of art, how that can be healing, mm. right? Mm. And it's been proven even with like clay and touch and how you um how it's therapeutic and making is a way of also forgetting when i've been in so much pain um a friend of mine was really really ill at the end of my ba and i didn't i didn't want to accept that she was dying and I remember staying up until they would kick me out at like midnight on my own, um, making hundreds and hundreds and hun- not hundreds, but like lots and lots and lots of these waxes that I was working on repetition and deconstructing them and breaking them. And it was the thing of like creation and then destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a, that was the only space I could be in. And, and non attachment. S- creation, destruction, and non attachment are overarching theme. And, you know, that space, I still feel now the space I'm most protective of is having a space that I can make, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm going through the process of looking for somewhere now and what is that space within us as well. I remember when I had to move out of a flat once and I was kind of sleeping on sofas and places and I didn't have a space to make over the summer while I was like looking for things and it just was the kitchen table. You know, I'd clear everything out, off, be there and focus in. Sometimes it has it has to be that. You don't have options to have that. Uh, both your parents are, mm-hmm. are artists. Yep. How were you raised to perceive art? This is an interesting thing for me of not having any creative people in the family and stumbling upon art consciously at around 20 and being oh, and being shaken and being like... What was the piece that did it? It wasn't like a piece necessarily. It was just like... Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a piece. It was more of like an, a mindset or a perspective. It was realizing that I had I was able to look at the world in a certain way and there were other people who had done that and they all happened to be artists. I think that was like <laughs> the main thing. And then I had to learn how to like look at a piece or or see learning to look at something, isn't it? There's a whole dialogue that, that the art world is also entrenched in that I think because of the way I've been brought up or the way that um, I'd have discussions with my mum and my dad who um, had gone to art school or whatever, that's interesting as well because I think everyone feels and everyone has emotions or opinions and that's obviously comes from their background as well. But like the language or how to see or look at things, I I don't know, I'm not really in in an art world, so, and I don't... And what does that even, also, like, what does that mean? Yeah, the idea yeah. of it is, is, the language of it is second, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me, because the language isn't about uh, semantics, it's about feelings, yeah. and the language between yourself and your senses, so that's, it's not necessarily about the language that we create to try and define it, it's about what's happening between the piece, the piece and, the, and the person. Yeah, absolutely, and, but that's what I mean in the sense that also, I totally agree with that, um, but there were ways of like reading a painting through the symbolism, or knowing a material, or oh, that's a piece from this era, or this epoch, or or whatever that is. Whereas I think um, I always thought, and maybe my opinions have changed on that, that a good piece of artwork uh, or a successful piece of artwork, it doesn't matter. It will um, everyone will be affected by it. Whoever engages with it, yes. regardless of your background, the way you have, what where you've come from, how you un understand thing and you just spoke about the, the the interconnectedness of all life yeah and if that is to be true then you can make a piece of work that speaks to the commonality of mankind you don't yeah. need our words you don't need our definitions or our boundaries we all share something whether we know it or not and a and a good piece of work should be able to speak to that. And even if somebody doesn't have the language, be able to go, something's happening here yes. in between me and this piece. I'm seeing something. And I, I, I grew up in a fucking council estate or whatever, so I don't have the words to describe it, but something's moving. Mm. 
So I don't, and and also like the people who invent the isms and the schisms and and all of the the boundaries and stuff and and definitions. It's like. They're trying to categorize. And they're trying to separate. To, they're trying separation. To, to to give some kind of limitation to something they don't or understand. Or exclusivity as well, isn't it? Yeah, I guess. Where I guess it's like it. this is only for, or you have to engage in a certain way to be able to. But then people will notice the color purple, and some people don't, or like the details in life. Well, that's the that's the 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 language of how to see a piece of work is to give yourself to it and be present. That's the that's the only way to see. Yeah. To, the only way to see a piece of work especially, but it's the only way to 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 be and to see is to is to be there with the piece and allow it to communicate with you. I think back to this idea of of when there was a separation in craftsmanship and and it turned into artistry. It's like whoever was looking at that piece at the time and drew the line and was like, something new is happening here, is because the piece is saying something mm. to them. And it's not necessarily what my issue is with uh, Eve Klein, Color Blue, that type of postmodernism work, where it's like, you're essentially having to be like, okay, do the work, most of the work, which I think is important for that period of time because people probably weren't doing that because they were so numb because of the atrocities of the world. And to look inward again, it was scary because that outward enemy is inside all of us. Mm. But but what's great about the, the work pre the World Wars is that it's saying something to you. It seizes you and it's beaming at something into you and that shakes you and that has the power to shake you as opposed to it being an intellectual process of where you kind of have to define it. You know, this. I think that's where, where I see us moving toward, you know, like like you said, what survives in, a, in an era of art, you know, and in the postmodern era coming out the back of that, I feel like what survives is the desire to create, the desire to connect, and the desire to have meaning. The desire because, to connect is actually very beautiful. The, the, I, I feel like we're all becoming very alienated even through various changes in technology and the way we're moving forward of how busy everyone has to be to even survive, the ability to connect is really important. Mm. And that's, I think, when you have Giotto's blue sky and you have this undercurrent of meaning behind it as well, Mm. that's kind of what art lacks now, the or has lacked in the past, in the most recent past, is the the beautiful color, but it applied to some kind of function. For using it to communicate something, shaping it, molding it, you know, being truly creative. Like you said, to get yourself out of hard times, the thing you've always gone back to is the manipulation of forms or the control over forms. But also that thing of conveying what it is that you're going through, it can be an outlet, right? So same with uh, creation of music or it's a way of... um, putting that emotion, that experience into something. Mm. And often people talk about who you're making it for or having an audience and uh, ultimately um, making something for this. It's like, well, actually, I often believe if you take it from a place of where you believe in it and it's because you want to make it and because of how you feel moved by something or about someone or about... Uh, the inside of a beautiful tiny cornflower and it's absolutely exquisite like the way it's formed and the way it's you know I I just think that in itself of like you wanting to then someone else will feel like that because that comes from a, a fundamental human aspect of us so with your parents and both them being artists yeah. and teaching you about the ways to see art how did they what did they inform you of? Was it purely about craft or was it? were they saying that it's some kind of vehicle for truth or, or a tool of communication? Like how was it that it was framed from an early age for you? I just have these amazing memories of like my mum would let me touch the artworks and I mean, that I find that weird as well, right? So one of the first senses we grew up, first 
uh, learn from is touch. <laughs> but in these spaces, it's always the emphasis on the visual when actually touch is so important. And I, rem I remember touching my dad's sculptures that were made of marble and stone and how they felt and feeling the grooves of it. Um, and again, like withdrawing how it feels when you paint or you use your fingers to like soften an edge or... Um, and so my experience of how my parents grew up like, was partly verbal and about narratives and stories that were moving and funny uh, and expressive and other parts was about um, materials. And so I could also read the language of a painting or how like a Francis Bacon, he pulls the paint or manipulates it and I could um, appreciate the technical aspect because I'd watch my mum paint or I'd watch my dad carve. And um, yeah, they were a huge influence in how I understand and see the world now um and also there was a period of time when because we were really poor because we uh, there were times when rent can be paid and things were really difficult that I didn't want to be an artist when people said to me what do you want to do I was like I want to be a marine biologist because I like the sea and I like fishes and I loved swimming so I just thought if I can be by the sea all the time that's great and I didn't want to struggle. I saw my parents often questioning everything about their lives. Is this good? Is this bad? This is crap now. I'm going to throw this away. Uh, we can't afford this. It's potatoes and salad cream again this week. And, you know, it was kind of like, um, I saw them struggle through a lot of things, but then there were moments of absolute divinity. And still now with my dad, even if we argue about stuff, he has this book about African um, artworks from all different uh, parts of Africa and we'll talk about like North African silver and the sculpture element of this or the ivory carving from West Africa and the masks and immediately we know what we're talking about and I still get excited by those conversations with him. So, um, yeah, I mean yeah, they've been really important and they are still very much living people that I have discussions with all the time. What made you think that choosing a life of uncertainty was <laughs> worth it? Oh, because it's the only thing I can really do. No, I... So many different things. I... Pff, makes me feel alive. I love it. I love making things for individuals as well. Um... And when someone turns around and goes, that's amazing, or I wear that every day, or this means so much to me, um, when it, I've done it through just wanting to commemorate someone I've loved and lost, or um, through something that I believe, and that's the manifestation of the form of which it's taken, whether it's one person who sees it, no one sees it, or it's just for myself. Um, yeah, things are still really uncertain, but a massive part of it has also been the tribe of people that have brought me up. So whether that's my parents' friends, my Italian family, the people I went to school with in Waverley at Peckham, which, or whether that's when I lived in Glasgow and I still see mates from Glasgow who are like, your stuff's amazing. And I'm like, oh, I just, sometimes I just think, I can't, I'm, I'm skin all the time. And they go you you have to keep doing it you're so talented and i love what you do we love what you do it will pay off it's just you're playing the long game it takes time so there's still maybe it's like an addiction as well it's like i can't give it up mm. even when i've tried and or i i just can't imagine anything else um and there may come a point when that has to change because of depending how the world changes or what, you know, set of circumstances life throws at you. Um, <sighs> depends on... But I I don't know. The only other thing I would say is I, I thought sometimes I'd be a plumber because I could work every day with my hands and solder and I love it and that would I'd still be connected to fire and making and water in some way. Um, <laughs> I just had the, the peep show, super hands line. It's like plumbing, it's easy, isn't it? <laughs> just water Lego. 
<laughs> what a Lego. <laughs> I did love Connects, which I remember being well into Connects. And when I got some, I was like, yes. <laughs> my granddad bought it for me because my dad was like, I'm not buying that for you. It's well expensive. And then my telegram would be like, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, it's really uncertain. There's, you know, anyone who's freelance, and especially if you're doing it in anything where the materials cost as much as they do yeah. with me, um, that there are times when it just seems totally ridiculous and why am I doing this? And, you know, you hear about people going on holidays or being able to drive their car instead of getting a bus or a train in the pouring rain, being like, I'm soaked, I'm tired. You know, people say to me, oh, you must love what you do. It doesn't matter that you're not earning money because you love what you do. And I'm like, yeah, except for sometimes doing seven-day weeks, working till midnight and, you know, not seeing anyone is... um, yeah, it makes you question whether or not you should be doing it. So what's the answer that you give to yourself whenever you ask, why am I still doing this? Because I love it and because I feel like it, that it's beyond me. Sometimes I can't explain it. It's like I... There was a point when I thought I'd go into theatre and wanted to be part of a contemporary, like, theatre group. And then I realised I don't like being too much in my own head or being the vessel of me being the product. It's a thing of I can put everything into this thing or the process of... It's the... That aspect. I don't even know how to put it into words. Mm. Um... And because it's not just working with your hands, because if that was it, then um, I'd work in a nice, like, small atelier or place doing um, sewing or carpet making, which I think actually part of me would be like doing that quite repetitive, therapeutic thing, which I get when I make chain, handmade mm. chainers like that. I think, yeah, I could do that. But then it's also about what you were saying about the story story the narrative the meaning behind something when it's got the ability to move someone to move you then it's you know I remember when I made the Medusa combs one of the first bronzes I did it was such a risk that I took it was so different from everything I'd done before and I just burst into tears like when I finished it because everything I'd wanted to say was in that one piece and I still feel there are people when they see that work and they're like, it's so deep. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, that was the th- first thing that Olivia showed me. Well, she showed me her ring that you made for her mm. and then she was like, but look at this and then showed me your Instagram and then showed me that and I was just like, straight away, I was, I understood. It was like nothing else to it. It was like, look, it's Medusa's comb and I was like, yeah, it is. That's fucking phenomenal. <laughs> that was literally what I was like. I was like, yeah, that it doesn't, just snaps you into a moment, you know. It's not like this long contemplation or, or about it. I just saw it and I was like, "Yes, that was it." It was a, it was such a statement that I didn't even have to think about being true, which is a, a rare experience these days of miscommunication, <laughs> of of uh, uh, of being able to just see something yeah. and and it be acceptable. It also, if you if you hold it, the weight of it. So yeah. a lot of people, even with rings or like, I'll give you, I'll show you this, right? If you hold it, the weight of something immediately. Oh, wow. So the tactile aspect of something and the way something feels. I love that you sniffed that. I often sniff objects as well. No, I do because I <laughs> You're check. You're lucky I didn't lick it. <laughs> <laughs> speaking to me um, you know the different senses of like there's a presence in it in the same way that like lacquerware in Japan is so inordinately light it's almost like it's going to take off um, and that I think is also material perceptions and different ideas of values and that goes into a whole other thing but um, the weight or presence of an object uh, of a piece of art of a of all sorts of things when you hold them and you feel it as well um there was a the the other piece which for me always moves me, and I'm not wearing it today because I left it in the studio. I was working till midnight last night, and I was really tired, so I forgot it. Which is the precious tear ring. Mm. So, just to put a, a kind of narrative context into that piece, so we're in 2014, 
my best friend died and then I my the person I was with broke up with me then I ended up in intensive care and I had brain damage I still have problem with short-term memory and was couldn't work for three years and I went through a total mental breakdown and I saw my mum uh, really suffer, and my dad really suffer from it, and my friends. I remember one of my friends now being like, you were different, and we didn't know if you were going to be recover as well. It was frightening. And I'm very, I'm so thankful to be alive and to be here now. And from that, I made a piece of work where I couldn't stop crying about my friend, and I felt really ashamed about it when I was in public, when I was on the bus and stuff. I'd just start streaming and feel bad about it. And it triggered all this research I did into tears and the different hormones that each tear has. So a tear for grief or a tear for joy or a tear for physical pain. They have their pain. own different like, frequencies almost. They have, yeah, different hormone and, and structure. What the fuck? That's yes. crazy. So when you cry of grief, it also has a mild sedative so that's why you're so exhausted after you've been crying a lot for the person you love that you've lost. And I thought this was so magical. I started to look into how also there is a type of butterfly in the Amazon forest that drinks the tears of turtles because they need the sodium to survive and make <laughs> babies. <laughs> We live in like a fantasy world. That's the most fantastical <laughs> thing I've ever heard in my life. That's like literally like written by like J.R. Tolkien or something. It's so poetic and beautiful. When you see this image of like a turtle sleeping with its little kind of um, tears that it just secretes for cleaning the eyes, because there's also that type of tear as well. <laughs> and you see these little butterflies all resting on its eyes, drinking the tears. Well, could you imagine them? <laughs> imagine being a butterfly and the mythology and the culture of butterflies yeah. of being like, you must get the turtle tear but because, how did like, you find out that you could drink a turtle's tear in the first place to to make sure that you could make little baby other butterflies. This is like, yeah, well, yeah, but this is also similar to something else that I can relate to humans more. Of like, well, I guess it it comes down to trial and error, but but like humans and ayahuasca, yes, of of, of the twenty thousand different roots in the Amazon that you can't actually eat, how do we pick Find the one ayahuasca. that works? Yeah. And not only that, pick the inhibitor that you have to take before. Oh, I didn't know you had to do that. So basically, there's 20,000 different roots in the Amazon. Of course. And are. only yeah. one of them, if you consume it before ayahuasca, like allows you to absorb the, pro the, D the DMT because the DMT is destroyed on contact with your stomach acid. But oh, this one root inhibits your stomach it acid. So then it, so it allows it to be absorbed. Interesting. So that's either centuries of trial and error and so many people giving up their lives to be like, yeah, I'll take it. And, and Isn't that an artwork? Yeah. In itself, like exactly. the actual discovery and use of ayahuasca. But the, the, the thing that's not, that's mind blowing, like it's not mind blowing yet, even though it's so mental. The thing that's mind blowing is when you think, but why did they even know, or how did they even know that the ayahuasca had, plant had magical properties if they didn't? If they weren't able to, to consume take, it. Yeah. So, so no one had taken it before. And how did they some, take that first route before they took the second route? But for some reason, someone's like, we need to find uh, a, an acid, stomach acid inhibitor so we can take this magical plant. Wait, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. That's crazy. I find, I, when you start getting into it of like how things were discovered, made why would you combine those things and how they've come about? It just all seems like, you know, is it preordained? Is it... Yeah, I don't believe is... in chance necessarily because that defies... You, 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 have, to, you have to really believe in, in chance to think that someone will just eat this magical plant mm. that inhibits your stomach and then eat the other thing and suddenly they start tripping out and having conversations with the whole of the cosmos. Like... <laughs> You ca I can only really logically be like, well, they must have known somehow mm. instead of it just being random. Mm. And similar with the butterflies, like they must somehow know that they the must tears somehow are there. know. Yeah, and that's that. It's that oneness of the fabric of of yeah. material reality. <laughs> similar with uh, uh, fungal networks in forests, because all the trees are connected via a fungal network. And if on one side of the rainforest there's about to be a drought. From the other side, where oh, there's no. an abundance of water, they send <gasps> they send 
See, messages. mushrooms, I've always said mushrooms are magical. Yeah, well, there's a, a, a book called uh, Mushrooms and the Sacred Cross or something, which basically... You have to be really careful about where you eat mushrooms if they've been near anything that's nuclear or what they absorb around them because they absorb everything as mm. well. My mum is an avid mushroom picker. Really? We used to go mushroom picking and mushrooms are quite like a thing in our family. Mm. And we have friends who dry her own porcinis and stuff, but my mum would always be like, we have to check areas or no because they absorb everything mm. and... See magical little mushrooms. It's it's, uh, it was, it's nature's internet essentially. It's just it's it, <laughs> nature's internet. I love it, that. It connects everything. <laughs> it connects, but it's also like nature's brain almost because it's speaking to to limbs. It's all woven in. It's all woven in. So like mm. you know, it some and and man's separation from nature is such that it's harder for us to plug back into that network, but there's ways for us to do it and you have to believe that most of the inexplicable things in the world that we have knowledge of mm. comes from that experience and but the thing is is that i feel like it's similar to art in that sense because art is almost like a, a type of internet type thing where it contains so much knowledge and information that even if it's only about one person, you know, a collection of all of their experiences and lessons and where they're at at a certain point in their life and, and the truth of, the, of that fact with themselves hopefully taken out of it enough for it to be able to penetrate you into like a universal space, into, into a... So there's that, that same principle, I think, in art because it marries so much time and space and shortens it down into like one central nervous system essentially mm. of where you, and then what you're experiencing is you plugging into that it's like mm. it's a less futuristic scientific way of me being able to plug into your mind and understand you and your experiences and learn from them and yeah. internalize them and like it's just a way of uh well yeah it's, it's just a way of communicating Experiencing things, as experiencing well. things like the thing with your friend passing away, and you've you've got grief now, and everybody has grief because everybody's going to die someday, and everybody has grief that they have to process in order to live fully. And when we lose someone that we love, that's presented to us in a in a manageable way because it's not something that's off in the future that mm. we're yet to experience. And you learn from that, or at least you process it. And you come out with this relic. Like you go into the pain. You go into that cave and you find a, a reason to continue, a reason to go again, a reason to love life despite the pain. And then you come back with like the ring or you come back with mm, the relic. That's it. It's going, it's a journey, isn't it? It's going into that. And sometimes we have those moments of. Uh, unknowing and having to take that leap of into what you're about to engage with and I think just kind of trying to connect to that or getting to the truth of it as well it can be frightening mm. um you know sometimes forcing yourself to connect with stuff doesn't always work it's about living and if you you know what's the famous saying if you um if you don't risk, you risk not living. Mm. So like that whole thing of, I think that all our experiences, um, there are connections, but also like if you become so entrenched in a certain technique or a certain thing, it becomes very sur surface level. And it's how do you find a certain material or technique which will be most... Um, would be the best vehicle for that narrative, uh, emotion, um, viewpoint. Message. Yeah, you know, the, and certain materials, again, going back to the sardonics and the painting, like different materials at different times in, in, our, in, in history um, and now and the future will continue to change in how people read things as well. So... Um, that's, I'm really interested in the future of how things are developing. And I do think that there's been a uh, renaissance about material and um, the application and the manipulation of it as well. It's just interesting, the periods of time between mm. renaissances, you know, would, the, the pendulum is kind of Becoming really, like this now. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like we've got to a point 
Or maybe we won't. Maybe we'll just keep going backwards back and forwards. forwards. But and it's always a reaction and a, you know... It'll probably go back to being 400 years, you know. But, but then when you actually think, well, for a renaissance to take 200 years, you got, people have got to feel like they've got things right. They've, the reason why renaissance has now happened, as we're seeing with you, is like in 20 years is because we realise we're in a time where the way we live or the way we perceive reality is not sustainable. No. So we have to, you know, the reason why it's doing that is because we're panicking, essentially, oh, and being yeah. like, we need, there's a return that's necessary here. There's a return to something that we've lost. Well, is the way forward actually the way backwards? It's like similar with wrapping things in cloth that uses wax, um, you know, growing our own crops rather than having loads of other people grow them and not having a... Um, a understanding or respect for agriculture or, um, you know, a lot using glass instead of plastic. It is almost like we'll... Mm. But then that's fine. It's like when you've experimented with something and go, actually, that's not the best way to do it. Maybe we go back to this or an altered modern version of that. I don't think there's... An, I think that's great if we can do that. But um, it's changing systems that are rooted that people benefit from. I mean, why has all the plastic in corner shops not being like why is it not made, being made illegal why have mm. we not just turned everything biodegradable and everything made out of glass which can be done because there are people who make a load of money from it and so that's stopped so the actual systems in which these exist which I think art can create those conversations and make people feel that you can change things a good film a good film that's a some films can change the world some artworks can change the world and they have um the way people perceive or f feel that they can do things and question who's in control and um empower people in ways that are significantly seismic mm. it's i'm interested by this train of thought by because now i'm thinking about okay cool well if we're in a in a process at the moment of recovery, yeah, recovering uh, a truer way to live, then first of all, how do we get there quicker? Yeah, obviously, there's a bureaucracy around it, which which is uh, makes things difficult to change. But you know how how can we? Where do we look back to to see? Okay, cool, that's where we went wrong. That's where we kind of fell off the path of a little bit and, and hopefully then can move forward a little bit. Um, and then I wonder about art's place in that. And I think, okay, well, art can restore the lost values. Art can put it on display and make it accessible and in the public consciousness and in the collective consciousness, like it can kind of bring them back into the forefront so it's much easier for, for, for us to find. Um, and, then I, and then I kind of get a bit bemused by that because I'm like well is, is art's place always in the past like is it always something that we use to look backwards no it can help you imagine forward completely same if you think even about um uh, artists who came to New York um after the second world war and the paintings I can't remember the name of the guy but the you know paintings of how they imagined future spaces, or even like a film like Metropolis or uh, Blade Runner. You know, okay, that's the f the past future, but to imagine, or actually I think it's really important, same with Black Panther, okay? So like creating realities that are future realities and presenting them about how things could be, it creates a sense of desire of wanting to change that. I think it's dangerous if we always stay in the past and think about how things were done, because we don't live in that time anymore. And lots of things about the past are crap. Like, you know, there's this romanticism that goes with it that I'm like, well, you know, Artemisa Gentileschi, who's one of my favourite painters of all time. Uh, she was incredibly um, talented, amazing uh, Baroque painters. Only now, way past her death, getting her her exhibition at the National and like getting some of the recognition. And pe people knew about her, but not so much because she was a female painter and obviously male painter. Well, anyway, that whole gender divide we know very much. Um, actually, by creating works that 
can show versions of a future um, or ways of even presenting things from the past to kind of um, show things that have repeated themselves perhaps through war or um, tendencies of ways we've treated people or injustices or good things as well can show and make people reflect on it um, to say, okay, we're, we're going to show this many things from past experiences and now imagine a, a future and how it's going to change. Um, I think having a kind of timeline sometimes is important because it makes you think about how those changes have happened or how they're feasible. Um, I think it's important to dream. Mm. Dreaming is about future, isn't it, in a way? Like, not so much about nostalgia or, oh, in the 90s it was so good because of this and the other, or the fashion was better, or hip-hop was better and it sounded better because the way it was recorded or whatever. It's like, okay, well, we're now, we're here. Um, let's dream about futures and how we can help each other create those and whether our artworks um, that we are creating as an infrastructure um, and as a network of individuals that come together, how are we supporting each other to be able to create those works? I think one of the things that concerns me is uh, funding for education. I do think that a lot of things start from education. Mm. Education and healthcare should be free for everyone worldwide. Like, that's the standard, right? And in places like our friend of mine who lives in Gothenburg, who I adore, Sanna Brantestad, she was, I remember when she first graduated, they gave um, studios to graduated artists for free. Mm. And I was like, what? Oh my God, it's like, we don't have that. And she was like, yeah, you know, we have that because it's saying we believe in you. What you're doing is important. To create, to have that support, to have someone that says what you're doing is good or we want to give you a space to be free mm. is is investing in it and that you know to be able to do my masters was really tricky and I wouldn't have been able to do it if there hadn't been certain things that happened um and I felt like a lot of people that I grew up with who came from similar backgrounds to me will never will never do their masters or have that space where they could explore in that way because really that's what a masters is is having that freedom to be in that space to do that um and to dream and think about future pieces because that's also where I did the Medusa combs and that's also where I made some of the best pieces or, or, or some of the best sketchbooks um, which are rich in in dreams and thoughts and questions which I can now pull out from and create new things. I like art. I like the definition of art as art as a way of getting past your preconceptions or getting past your prejudices. There's, there's something beautiful in that, I think. Yeah. You know, the art is a tool to communicate the commonalities of everything, which is a, a beautiful thing to behold. How do you land at the Medusa combs? Like, what was... What, can you remember the idea? Yeah, I was looking at narratives of Medusa, so I was working on a project which was called Red Thread, and we were talking about finding the common thread that runs through things. And I was I was like, I wonder why actually, um, why the story of Medusa has been portrayed by so many different artists. So Bernini, sculptor, the, which interestingly, the Medusa is the only piece he ever made that wasn't a commission. He did it because of the love of what he does, and it was all a story about him being... But anyway, that's another thing, but... Rubens, um, Caravaggio, Canova, um, uh, lots of different like modern artists as well, and I can't think of his name now. Um, who did a beautiful piece of all the different African wax batik, um, turned them into snakes. But all the different artists, I was like, why has Medusa been a, a topic or something that has been looked into? And as a as a woman now living here, what would be my version of Medusa? And so I did a lot of research into the story of Medusa, the history, its origins, the ceramics that it came from, um, like Hellenistic Greek sculpture, and then the new classical copies of it, um, 
and sort of characteristics or how in different times there've been all different interpretations of her. And then I, I, something people don't always know about me is that I'm obsessed with hair. So I had always really short hair growing up as a kid. My mum used to just cut it all off. And I'd be like, people think I'm a boy. I don't want short hair. I want long hair. And then when I got really big when I was growing up, I almost felt like it had, my hair was the one thing that was really feminine about me. And if I had good hair, however ugly I was, or the people didn't want to like or would say mean things about me the girls would always be like your hair looks really good I used to spend ages with a round barrel brush and I still do it now uh, that I dry my hair in a certain way and I, I take real pride in my hair and my auntie also I remember she's Italian so she'll never hear this but when I was looking through the bathroom and stuff in her house I have this memory of finding a plait that had been just cut and I was like this much hair plaited I was like oh my god and also going to school in Peckham we used to go to a lot of the hair shops a lot of my friends used to spend hours in the car in classrooms plaiting hair and I used to help um and I just love everything around hair culture when you go to the hairdresser it's one of my favorite things you sit and it's a counseling session you know your hair being like washed and like the act of washing your hair and renewal you often hear when someone has a breakup they cut their hair off um the change of like you know how in some religions you don't cut your hair or what is it to show your hair? So there's all this loaded thing with hair. And I was like, everyone has hair or doesn't have hair and what it means to not have hair mm. as well and have receding hairline, hair loss. Um, do you have Afro hair? Do you have white hair? Do you bleach your hair? Do you straighten your hair? What does it mean to have unruly hair? One of the things with Medusa was that she had, you know, the transformation of her hair into snakes is one of the predominant things. And I looked into metamorphosis and transformation and then that kind of, okay, what materials are associated to that and actual language and semiotics. So uh, the word petrified, so when the people who were turned to stone by Medusa's glare, petrified means being so scared, but it also means the actual ossification of wood into stone over time. And I thought that was really interesting. And I... And at first I made this whole chain that was going to be a snake chain. And I was like, oh, that's really clever because it's like a snake and it's a chain, but it's not a snake chain. And I was like, oh, it's so obvious. I'm not doing that. Then then at the time, a friend of mine asked me if I'd make her a Medusa ring. And I said, yes, okay, but I've always wanted to do a Medusa. So at the time I was making a ring of a portrait and I was trying to get the expression of absolute, like, the moment of transformation whilst also working on these combs. And basically, I went back to the comb and I went round Catford, Lucian, Peckham, all places I grew up, and Deptford, and went to all the hair shops and bought plastic cheap combs that cost a pound or 50 pence, all different types. And I manipulated them and changed them and I made bronzes of them. Um, so it was this moment of by taking something cheap, mass produced, um, readily available, transforming it into bronze, which is synonymous with ancient sculpture, Hellenistic pieces, some of the bronzes that you would think of um, that have been found under the sea and often about the stories of Medusa, immediately you change the value or the way that it's thought about. But for me, it's also about damage and actually in, as a woman and... Um, that whole thing about emotionally what hair is. So the tendrils changing, they look like they're recoiling. There's a, a kind of... And the story of Medusa is tragic. She was this beautiful woman who was raped and because of... Her, but she was raped in the temple of uh, was it Athena. Athena condemns her and turns her into this painful monster, which then she gets beheaded and used. But then in her beheading, she becomes incredibly powerful. And as a symbol, you know, she's used to then by Perseus to save Andromeda. And so she, the head of Medusa has been, and she's also worn on the armour of Athena is this incredibly powerful thing. And so there's a really kind of um, 
all kinds of layers are to do with female power and the fear of it and the hurt that through centuries women have been raped, abused, um, burned, turped, told they're witches, children are still, um, you know, F- are just all kinds of things of like the hatred and hurt of women that for me this piece is were about transformation and about trauma and about the ability to change. So, the, yeah, they're really loaded. For me, it was like a... But then all of my pieces, in some way, often are to do with transformation because a lot of the pieces I make which are wearable or that what live with an individual are about their ability when they t- put something on of recognising something and the change that that creates, or totems, talismans that have are imbued with certain powers um, that uh, to, are a part of your narrative. So, I really, I'm really interested in this idea of metamorphosis. Mm. Why? Um, Why an obsession with transformation and transcendence? Because it's amazing, like when you see something change. I remember seeing in a butterfly house a, a cocoon and the butterfly coming out and the unfurling of its wings and and change. And probably because there have been moments when I thought my life couldn't change. When Even when I was a child, when I wasn't very happy, um, when I changed and how that brought me joy... So that wasn't a pun intended, but, um, you know, how transformation um, and the renewal of the self. Why is that important to be shared? I love that they are worn every day, that when you, it's almost like a touching touch point as well. Like when I'm nervous, I'll touch the ring I'm wearing or the pendant that my mum gave me. Or when I'm talking too much, I remember that I'm wearing tiny little listening aids, they're tiny ears. I can get, I talk a lot when I'm nervous. I think we should all be better listeners. So I made those with the premise of, I want to be a better listener and I want to actively listen because it's different to listen and to actively listen when you suspend your own inner dialogue to listen to the other person. So for me, the pieces I make enable and help people and in the wider scope, help people as well. Um, so that's why I get, I really get off on that. The, the reason I love art is because it's imbued with a meaning and a message that reminds me of sacred truths that we all share and understand on a more than personal level, on a really spiritual, primordial level. And I, when I think about jewellery now in, in the context of this conversation and obviously in the context of you, it's like, what better than having the, the, it being in a gallery is it being with you at all times and you know access even a tactile sensual access to it of it being connected to your body of it being like uh, an extension of you I think is a really beautiful thing um, and being just being you know I always liken art to a totem or a relic of an individual's encounter with the unknown it's the trophy that's brought back that it's the Medusa's head that's like, I won. I looked into the unknown. I stepped out into nothing and I'm still here. So to actually think, instead of it being a metaphorical relic, it being you've transformed mid- it into it's actually a relic. It's actually a totem that you can have next to your heart, you can have in your pocket, that you can touch in moments of uncertainty, that you can, that you can call on or fall yeah. back on or just engage with that brings you back to your center i think is a really really incredible thing that you've made me Thank realize you. <laughs> one of the people i always reference to kind of make people just change a little bit their just a little bit the perspective about jewelry and the wearable object and the relationship of the object and the body is someone called Otto Kunzli, who was a jeweler from Switzerland who uh, his brother passed away and he inherited all these tools from his brother and fell into be going and studying jewelry. And he ended up making pieces which really deconstruct the way that people think about jewelry. He made a, um, he put out a 
newspaper which had, um, I'm looking for divorcees, wedding bands, like an ad in a newspaper. And he collected all these wedding bands that had come from divorces. So you have this wedding band that you don't wear anymore because of love loss. Mm. And he made a chain from them. He cut them, soldered them on together. And it becomes an emotionally unwearable piece of jewellery. And that just kind of shattered my perceptions of what, like, wearability, emotional yeah, aspects. It's, like, like the, it's the same as Giotto, like the fracture, the the realize of the realisation of the otherness yeah. reveals to you what actually it, it is in the first place. And, you know, my mum had a ring that looks like a small cubist sculpture which when we were really skint my mum had inherited some jewelry from her italian family and we sold all of it because we t- we just pawned it because we couldn't afford the rent and for me also that's why jewelry is cool because i was always like if you're really really if desperate pinch, yeah. yeah there's a and my mum even says it there's something we have in our family that she's like i'm never gonna sell that because if you ever need to get a boat across the world because you're at war you can sell this you know th- and that is like <laughs> that's the thing that is like which i find just all of that is you know value and material and stuff is really complex as well but this small ring I'm obsessed with it and I love it and it's a sculpture and just it in itself also because it's related to my mom and I remember when she would prepare to go and meet someone or have a discussion it was like the thing she put on that mentally prepared her before she went and did that and that was really important and in the same way with the precious tears piece that I made after Freya so my godfather is her father and he came to see my master's show and we sat for hours just talking about things and um, I discovered that his wife was really unwell, Belinda, Freya's mum. And I was wearing the precious tear I'd originally made, which I did as my, you know, like in Inception, there's the totem that you touch back yeah. to know you're at reality. I made, after I did uh, post-trauma therapy, my therapist was like, make something that is like your totem. And I made this ring so that I always wore... And when I found out that Belinda was really unwell, I said, I took off the ring and I said, this is for you, you should have this. And he gave me a hug and we had a cry and uh, Belinda's now sadly passed away really recently and um, we all miss her a lot. And for Peter to have gone through what he has, you know, I know that he wears and uses that piece and I made myself a new one because it was like the change and resurgence of like that's still for me I need that totem and I'm planning to meet up with him soon and talk to him and see him and that kind of transference of an object uh, or something that's imbued with meaning um There's a story a friend of mine gave me, this small essay, which I always use as an example as well, of um, a teddy bear, which was, there was this, in the Second World War, there was a pilot that went out and he was out in the trenches after flying, they'd uh, had a problem and he his daughter, he receives a parcel and in the parcel is her teddy bear and there's a letter with a teddy bear that goes, um, you know, uh, Teddy always looked after, you gave it him to look after me and now I'm giving you Teddy so he will look after you while you're away. And they found the body of the soldier holding the teddy bear And that's now in the Imperial War Museum. And immediately the context of by putting or imbuing that feeling or sentiment into an object, it changes it completely immediately, you know, how you perceive or look at it. So obviously, yes, um, the way in something's made or the way that you look at it, but also the actual emotion and intent of how you make something or give something changes it completely. Never thought of an iPod as jewelry before, but now I'm like, it's almost yeah. dissimilar in a sense of that it's just this vehicle for the music, which is just a vehicle for a meaning that you listen to when times get tough or you need a boost or you need something yeah. from it. Yeah, you just plug it in, and it's it's a similar sort of concept. So it's interesting to think of an iPod as a but piece it is of it's an extension of uh, iPhones have become an extension of ourselves completely and I was thinking a lot about how we touch our screens more than we touch each other I did a silver thumb that was like back in 2011 I was experimenting with stuff where I was like 
that's become the thing we all crave at the moment is, you know, likes or that recognition from other people and and that thing that we touch this object more than we ever really engage or touch each other, I think is quite frightening. Mm. Little Wayne. Oh, yeah. I know it's a, I know it's a hot, <laughs> so it's a pretty uh, obvious button, but it's interesting to hear about how he sees your work and uh, and says, I want something. It wasn't him who commissioned it. Oh, really? No. Okay. It was his friend. Like a get as like a gift. Yeah, well, that's even better. I know. I was um, was in my second year at the RCA, and I couldn't afford my second year. And I'd also been awarded a research fellowship to go to Japan, which they were giving me money for. But if I couldn't afford to go into the second year, I couldn't go. Mm. So my aunt had uh, paid for me to go and see her in Italy because I couldn't even afford the flight like a Ryanair flight to go and see my family and I was out there and I was having a panic and I was preparing myself to ask if I could borrow some money from her to finish my master's and she it's not really her money it's, well it's all complicated family stuff anyway, I won't go into that but uh, I was really desperate I was really like I really am loving doing this and I really want to finish my master's I don't have any money my mum has no money my dad can't help um, what am I going to do? And I was applying for friends friends were helping me with applications to different um, charities, funds, and I find that really hard. Mm. And I was like applying for loads of stuff, trying to find funding. And then I got this email saying, hello, uh, through a friend of a friend, I saw your work, I love it, I'd love to commission a piece. I said, yeah, sure, but it might be a bit of a wait because I'm just trying to work out stuff with school. And then they said, well, it'd be quite a significant piece, it might help you with your school. And I was like, okay. And then they said who it was for. I ran around the room I was in, kind of going... (laughs) uh, My Italian family won't understand. Um, (laughs) How do I explain this? And I was really like freaking out because also people have asked me to do things and then it's fallen through. And I, you know, I was kind of a bit like overwhelmed. And because of the time difference, we had a phone call um, and we just talked for ages. And this person was lovely, it was so kind, it was so lovely, and explained to me why they wanted to make this piece for Wayne and what it meant. And we talked about the design and um, what it should look like, how it should feel. Um, and I said yes, and I sent her two quotes for two different types of things. She said this one, I said okay, and then she was like, can it be done in, I think it was under a month, which for me, to do something like that is really difficult. Uh, It can take me up to nine months sometimes to work on one piece, and I was like, (laughs) I've just got to make it happen. Um, Yeah, and I made it, and I stayed up very late nights, I worked on it, and um, it meant that I could finish my master's. It also uh, meant that I'd made work of that kind of scale and um, in that way for the first time, and it was fantastic. It was an amazing experience, and I still pinch myself that it happened yeah it's a bit of a miracle <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> I'm still like I don't know maybe it was Freya maybe it was Nono maybe it was Grandma and but also like the friend of a friend who it came through I felt that the way that they'd found out about my work was because I have a very good friendship with someone and we'd supported each other and I think that a lot of things come through kindness mm. so a lot of things that have come in my life is because I've genuinely helped someone or done something. Same with my mum. My mum actually came through to Japan when I was there because she'd helped a friend of hers who was dying, who was homeless, who no one would help. And she gave him somewhere to stay when no one else would give him somewhere. And then he inherited some money and said, look, you should go and see Joy in Japan because you would love it and you love moss and you're going to love it. And my, it was really surreal. I had this moment with my mom where I'd just done an interview on the toilet to the BBC because it was like 2 a.m. and they'd caught me while I was in the bathroom in my tiny apartment in, in Kyoto, in the suburbs of Kyoto. And I was like, on the phone, my mom arrives and we're there in like with temples and stuff. And I'm looking at my mom and I'm like, has this really happened? 
is this really happening? Like, all these things, and after all the difficult stuff that's happened in the last few years for us, it was just magical. And, you know, for someone, also the fact that this person had wanted to make something for Wayne because they mean a lot to them. It's just lovely. Yeah, it's beautiful. What are you curious about at the moment? What is piquing your interest? Mm, look. No, go on. I was going to say, what's, what's fascinating you? Um, lots of different things. Um, I'm trying to think what something I'm specifically I'm working on at the moment. The feeling of chain and handmade chain. So a lot of, all chain used to be handmade. And even chains, the ideas of shackles, chains, breaking chains, adornment of chains. What does it mean to have a big chain, a small chain? What's attached to the chain? Um... I was looking at chains and reading a book about chains and I'm making a piece at the moment for that is for someone where I've carved all the links and um, it's quite big and like what big chains mean. I'm making a piece for a, a musician. She's a poet and um, and the symbol that we've done, how that um, goes into her heritage as well. And we were just talking a lot about that and I was... I'm really interested in chain at the moment and also because a lot of chain was handmade and then there was a change in the Industrial Revolution, which the mechanisation of things, how most chain you find that you that you buy in Hatton Garden or online or isn't, it's machine made. And it, that is another video to watch. If you ever look at how chain is made with a machine, it's amazing. Okay. Like also like big chains used for cranes and like yeah. how you lift things. Um so chain is something I'm kind of interested in at the moment. Let's wrap it up there then. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and chatting to me. You're I feel very like welcome. I've definitely learned something. And I've definitely uh, having ideas now. I'm gonna end up hounding you with questions like, "How do you do this?" and "How do you do this?" And <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to come to the studio anytime. And also, like, thank you for having me. To I think it's really important to create these spaces. I miss sometimes. I had one of my flatmates in Glasgow who we always used to talk so much like this and um, we live far away from each other now or just living in a space with a kitchen table would be like an hour-long discussion about semantics or why the colour orange, I don't know, means something in one part of the world, you know. Mm. Well, it's amazing. Uh, to to have people who are open to having these conversations and on camera as well for that added Ooh. level of uh, jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm like, be like this my whole time. Saying, but thank you, you so much. We should do this again when you get round to making your living flower piece. Oh gosh, so, yeah. When that Ikebana's done, I will be like, you got to come and see it. Yeah, I'm down for it. Thank you so much, Joy. <laughs> Welcome, thank you. Oh, I need a wee now. <laughs>